This is the 21.5 Show. You're on 121.5, the emergency frequency. Whether you're a professional pilot or want to be one, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Join professional aviators Dylan and Max as they talk their experience in the airlines, business aviation, and more. Life is good. Industry experts, unique stories, and plenty of fun. This is the 21.5 Show. It is another episode of the 21.5 show, the show for professional pilots by professional pilots. Hello, everyone out there. It's me, Dylan, joining you from the Spring Hill Suites. <laughs> if you could only see, see the incredible artwork behind me. These it's walls. your turn to be in the hotel and mine That's to be right. at home. I like yeah, it. Yeah, the tables have turned. But we're making it happen. I'm excited for my children and, and wife to break through the door here in about 15 minutes. So when you hear a big loud uh, commotion you're gonna know what's gonna happening but i'm not gonna let a vacation stop me from uh broadcasting that's right don't let that stand in your way no no welcome to the show if you're new here hello one of us is usually broadcasting from a hotel room because we are both professional pilots my name is dylan i'm in business aviation and i'm joined by my co-host max who hello. I, I recently learned that you've lost all your hotel status max is that true yeah, pretty much. I, I, yeah. I have no real status. Just the ones they make you think you're somebody like a gold member, you know, you should have seen the, the, the I mean, the grin on my face when they handed me the, the paper bag with two bottles of water in it to thank Woo! me for my loyalty today as I checked into this. That's bag. the that is the one thing. If you are a business aviation pilot and you're going to come to the airlines, if you could get to that lifetime status, that yeah. would be that would be pretty sweet. You didn't get there? No, I not. I never got close, which I see myself as actually a victory. That's because, a huge win. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But if you are already in that situation, are you close? Like, just <laughs> just hold out. You're saying go, go just just buy a week in the off in Phoenix in July at the uh, Marriott or something and get the days. The real value I found is really just being able to get the free breakfast when you have kids. That That's the real money saving. The upgrades and everything else are pretty hit and miss. I guess you got a point. Like, really, yeah. what am I missing? Like, what? It's not a ton. It's not a ton. Honestly, I'd, I'd rather take the uh, the discounted rates at the bar than the lifetime diamond status. What? Well, can you talk? Th there's a lot of rumors about some of the the discounts that are out there. Can you dispel some of the myths? What What are the myths? I used to hear that they used to have what was it called, like the one two three rule or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's okay. All. That ship. That was a myth, right? No, that was a thing. Okay, for explain sure. that. Explain that to the listeners. I, I don't really know. It was like a dollar for a beer, two dollars for a a wine, drink, or three dollars for a wine, or vice versa, something like yeah. that. I, it was before my time, but that was like that was true. That was hard and fast rule for a long time, from what I understand. But yeah, that was like yeah, now it's just contract. now it's very there's no there's no consistent thing, but it's it's usually discounted sometimes heavily. So it's you know it's all over. It's a percentage. It's there's a special menu for crew members. There's mm. just drinks or yeah, what non whatever or domestic drafts or this or any beer on draft is that whatever. It's there's it's all but they are good. It's the perks of the job. It's all that's all I can say. I don't know. What's it well, doing? if you're corporate or airline, you just gotta sniff out the perks. What's one of the abilities the pilots have, right? Finding oh, the, yeah. uh, oh, the freebies, yeah. taking advantage. Oh yeah, we could talk about the old days of the Atlantic bucks and the top, the yeah. double bucks for the top off. Remember that in the G three, mm -hmm. and I would actually like lay down behind the cockpit so they couldn't see, so I could like reach up real quick and slap the shutoff valve, so they think that you know they were single point feeling and it topped it off. And then you like, get oh, the, we yeah. fared fuel in, but we're still going to top it off because we want those bucks. And then we'd sit there and watch the fuel gauge and shut it off. They're like, oh. It was a top off. I, or, that was only. This is a Gulfstream, and you only pumped 530 gallons. I'm like, top off. Two words, honey. Okay. And, I not, and I'm not talking about you. I would not ask that of you. You were not pretty enough. I want the bucks. Uh, well, those Atlantic bucks still exist, but uh, the trading the trading floor opens every year. I like it. Lots of uh, actual, real, valuable information in this show uh, beyond uh, Atlantic Books and Hotel Points. Uh, we like to discuss. We got an interview with someone from Space Force. And I knew pretty much nothing about Space Force. 
until this interview. And I think most folks probably don't know a ton about it, but I think you're going to learn something and you're probably going to enjoy it. I, I know I did, Max. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. She taught us like the, the secret handshake they have and the whole thing. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, we covered the moon base being constructed, the whole whole deal. It's, it's going to be great. No, but seriously, it was really, uh, really interesting. So stick around for that. Also, our boy Tim Pope is going to join us to talk about some Delta pilot uh, retirement programs and uh, what might be coming to other airlines in the future as well. Uh, lots to get to with the mailbag, flight advice, the whole shebang. We're doing it even while we're on vacation. So glad that you're joining us. Let's jump right in. Joel, I see you, you hiding there in the corner with your mic muted. Hello. I heard that you're going to be making a cross-country trip in the light airplane soon. Could, do you want to uh, t- tell the listeners what you're up to? What? Oh, it's going to be a grand adventure. So I don't have my pilot's license, uh, but my older brother does. He's got a little Cessna, and he lives down in Mississippi and uh, has some acres down there and stuff and has a lot of fun flying around with all the F-18 pilots that are his instructors and stuff like that, you know, down there. Maybe uh, he's coming back up uh, for a little bit and then going back down with him to Mississippi and then flying Spirit Airlines back on up after that. But yeah, the old T-41 Mescalero, which is just the... That's what he flies? That's what he has? Yeah. Which is a military version of the 182 or something? 172, yeah. Yeah. Oh, 172. Much, yeah. The Mesca what? Mescalero. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a magical little is he, airplane. Is he going to let you uh, handle the controls, Joel, you think? Maybe, maybe. Now, here's maybe, the fun part. Hey, I know. You could pretend you're in a PC-12 and just satisfy all your boy dreams. We're going to fly until we find one, and then we're just going to just gonna thumb it all over. Hey, <laughs> he's got a, an ultralight down there, too. Maybe uh, it's time just to go flying. Who needs a license? You don't need a license. Send us a selfie <laughs> right before you crash. <laughs> right before you, John Denver. All right. <laughs> well, that'll be fun. It'll be exciting. We're, we're, can we uh, look forward to some content maybe on the road? Or oh, we'll we vlog Max, the whole thing. Yeah. Ma- mount that um, 360 cam on the wing like we did when we went to see Roger Reeves, maybe. Yeah. So so I've got a funny yeah. story from being on the road. I was in Austin the other day, and we pulled in at Millionaire. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, so we pulled in the FBO there and uh, parked, and then they were like, hey, we're going to need you to move. Um, or we're going to need to move your airplane because uh, we've got a bunch of airplanes coming in. I'm like, okay, no problem. So they, they push us out of the way. And we go to lunch. We come back. I'm looking at the ramp. and I'm like, wow, there's a lot of PC-12s on the ramp. There's like four of them. Another one taxis in. Another yes. one taxis in. I'm yes. like, what in the world yes. is going on here? <laughs> After about the 15th PC-12 rolls in, I get outside. I'm like, I got to get a video of this for Joel. So I like video all of these. And then as I'm like doing this video another one taxis by so i finally get up on my phone it was the pilatus owner national pilatus convention going on at the millionaire in austin so i I don't know how many ended up being there but uh joel next year we're gonna have to send you there for live coverage i think uh i don't know where it's gonna be located (laughs) joel (laughs) Joel, coming to you live from a swarm of (laughs) pc12 on the rampant millionaire his thumb out there just trying to hitchhike anywhere somebody please yeah so (laughs) otherwise uh, known as heaven yeah, Thanks. exactly. A guy from a farm in Ohio. <laughs> need a ride. A long way. <laughs> this so, is my dream plan. Yeah. So that is. It's your so dreams do come true. It is it, a, a magical <laughs> gathering that I didn't I wasn't even aware that there was a association for the PC twelve. Oh, there's an association for everything. Yeah, exactly. So that uh that was exciting. Joel, anyone uh, talking about the show these days? Any uh, anything in the news? Well, they sure are. Uh, we got a review, five stars from Joshua and Sparks. He says, engaging, informative, funny, very informative, even for us technicians and private pilots. Love the real life stories about the nuances of our industry. Thank you, Joshua. Send us your address, Joshua. We'll send you some stickers. We've also had some uh, social media call outs here. One right after the cargo episode. Thank you for bringing awareness to our industry on this podcast. You sent an I message, watched a movie on a computer or tablet, gamed on a computer. You should thank a cargo pilot. Most people would be surprised and shocked at what travels by air. Just grab the nearest no tack from an ACMI or a cargo carrier, David. Right. 
Also, a lot of congratulations on surpassing the 100 episode mark. Navy Pilot Nick says, great work. Love listening every time I make a run across the Sea of Cortez. <laughs> I think that was a joke. <laughs> Weren't we joking about the, yeah, my big, at my first big international I, at, first, at first, I was like, uh, oh, why would a Navy guy be making a run across the Sea of Cortez? Like, I don't think they bring the <laughs> aircraft carrier in there. No, it's because I was talking yeah. about all my new international yeah. flying. Yeah, I know. Then I realized he was making fun of you. I think that's yeah. hilarious. Uh, you had me rolling with the Overwatch bantering. Congrats on number 100, Navy 8 Navigate Tom. Uh, uh, he'll come back, the Overwatch yeah. guy. Yeah. <laughs> we need to give him a name. Let's just name him real quick. <laughs> and then the uh, interaction continues on the Roger Reeves episodes. Billy Jean says 38 years old and had 7 million. Damn, he could have retired. Got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them, I guess. Okay. Well, thanks to everyone that wrote in. Uh, if you left us a review, thank you. I'd love to say thank you by sending you some stickers. Just shoot us an email info at 215podcast.com and uh, give us your mailing address and we'll shoot those into the mail. And if you'd like to leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, we'd certainly appreciate it. It, it gives Joel something to do to, you know, aggregate all of these. Uh, you know what I just realized different. is actually pretty funny. So, we're we're trying to put together we have some really good merch ideas and we're trying to you know working on getting who's going to print them and all this and and the big thing is like well who's going to ship this out we don't want to inventory this and ship it and maybe we'll have some company drop ship it and it just occurred to me that <laughs> we're having this whole discussion about who's going to ship actual like cool stuff to people that they're going to pay for and Dylan every episode is hawking away looking to send free stickers to anybody <laughs> We we'll write a review. It's like this whole, I don't want to do it. I but Dylan's like, yeah, I'll send you some stickers. No problem, bro. Well, so that's a little bit irony. easier. You're putting something in an envelope and you're addressing it. You're actually having to lick a stamp in this instance. Okay. Are you hand addressing these? You guys don't know how we shipped these. Do you know how we shipped these hats out to everybody? Yeah, I, I remember in the to, poly like, mailer. Errors. I had to use a straw and in manually inflate i used a food sealer bag that you lent me a food like a food sealer you would seal it like 90 percent closed with the hat in there and then you would stick this straw in and i would like blow it up and like fully inflate this bag and then i had to like quickly get it into the food sealer to seal the rest of the thing so the bag would stay inflated so the hat wouldn't get crushed oh my god. if you want our instagram channel yeah. really take off put a video of that of the oh my god <laughs> real of inflating the bag the process by mouth. Oh, my, it's mouth inflation of these bags. For these hats. It was just. I was wondering why my hat was wet when I got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> why it smelled like nachos. Yeah, oh, that's the best. Yeah. So yeah, I'm a little traumatized from that. So uh, <laughs> I can see no more hats, people. No Whatever more hats. you have, it's it's it. That's that all we got. It. Yeah. Everything else is going to be non-crush sensitive. Yeah, if you will. Exactly. <laughs> Straw. Yeah, I had to. <laughs> you. Same. Yeah. Like with the USPS, like. <laughs> And then I'm like cutting the thing, at, yeah, taping it. And then every like one out of every ten bags would pop. So then I'd have to do it again. Yeah, it was dumb. So I'd show up to the post office with like seven or eight of these. Like and it's hard to carry because it's like these inflated bags, and you're like walking in. And you look like this. Yeah, it's dumb. Uh, so yeah, you can do the merch, Max. You, you knock yourself out. I'm yeah. happy to put a couple stickers in an envelope. We'll see. Yeah. Anyways, um, all right. Well, that's it for the reviews. Uh, I'll send you a sticker. That's it. No hats. If you want it in an inflated bag, just ask. You have to make a donation on the website. <laughs> Maybe you could fashion it a sticker. Maybe you could roll it up and put it into a balloon and then inflate that and tie it off. Would that be mm -hmm. cool? Yeah, you be, think? Yeah, it'd be great. As long as you're going to use the food saver thing. Just get the ones that have a little confetti. That way when they pop it, it's like, woo, oh, <laughs> sticker. No, it just came. Man. Like sending, like how you can send an iMessage. Mm, fireworks. All right. Over to the mailbag, which is, of course, brought to you by our friends at Advanced Air Crew Academy, aircrewacademy.com. And you can check out all of the offerings they have available to your flight department. There's a new one, Max, that they just released. This one may be a value if you're in business aviation, if you're, if you're trying to recruit somebody new. It's the second in command professional development program. The SIPDP program allows an SIC in a multi-engine airplane or single-engine turbine-powered airplane in Part 135 operations to log SIC flight time during operations that do not require a second pilot. Part 135 operators receive the authorization for an SIC PDP through Ops uh, Specs A062 
which requires additional training for the PIC that flies with these SICs. The one hour training module meets the PIC mentor training that is specified in the regs. The training module is customized for operator specific procedures. You can check out more about that. We'll have a link in the show notes. Just another reason why Advanced Air Crew Academy is really That is awesome, dude. Yeah. That's a solution to one of the age old can I log it questions. It's genius. So hats off to Advanced Air Crew Academy for uh, making that process a little bit easier. We'll have a link in the show notes. The mailbag, I would say, uh, it's a quality versus quantity. Joel, is that accurate today? Yeah, that's about, that's about right. Okay. What do we got? Gentlemen, I just finished listening to episode 101. And I have to say, I'm quite disappointed in Chris and Jeremy. They made horrible arguments against single pilot and zero pilot operations. I thought the episode was going to end with a hashtag cargo pilot lives matter. Please allow me to extrapolate. Chris and Jeremy made arguments against the advent of new technology in the cockpit because it will take our jobs. That's the same argument that 200 French tailors made in 1831 when they destroyed a sewing machine factory because they said it would take their jobs. Chris and Jeremy made the argument that a computer could not have done what Sully did. I would argue, and I think Sully would too, that a computer would have done Sully's job better by immediately returning to LGA. Sully openly admits that the human factor involves a delay reaction time. A delayed reaction time of a microprocessor is milliseconds, much less than that of the human brain. And they made the argument that humans have the will to live. That's great, but that's why you get so many stall spin accidents at the departure end of the runway. Because the pilot sees the trees coming up quickly and pulls up immediately to avoid hitting them. A computer can be programmed to pitch for best glide and hold it regardless of what's in front of it. I agree that we'll likely be replaced by computers soon. I've accepted it. But this idea that we should pay pilots to do what a computer could do safer and more efficiently is very short-sighted. I mentioned that to a pilot who was high up in the Teamsters Union about six years ago. I told him if we keep creating these barriers to entry in attempt to drive up our salaries, we're going to be replaced by computers. He responded, yeah, but I'll be retired by then. I still love the show. I've played every episode. Can't wait for the next one to come out. Rob? Well, that was a downer, Rob. Interesting perspective. I, and I think Rob has some interesting points about uh, what a computer would do. I, I think, and I, I don't disagree with a lot of them, like, as, you know, say, avoiding a stall spin, maybe going right to best glide speed. I think the problem that's that's hard to quantify now is, Yes, it might eliminate some or, or many or maybe even all of the human errors that are made. But what would the computer errors be that, that a, a human would be able to intervene and, and catch? That is unknown. Now, the good news is you can run simulations on a lot of this stuff and, and try and perfect the essentially the AI, right, that would be, would be flying this airplane. I think that really probably as usual, it's going to be a marriage of both, right? It's going to be using the intelligence of the computer and the quick reaction times along with the the human pilot being able to kind of think in a way that a computer can't. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's already kind of coming into play with there are some, God, I, I think it's Garmin has it or whatever, where there's like, bank limiting um, functionality built into the autopilot stuff where you're not on autopilot, but it prevents you from doing something you shouldn't. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, as you see, like his example with the stall spin accident where maybe, you know, it recognizes that and, and won't let you pitch up because it knows that's a, that's a, a human trait that's generally not favorable in that situation. So yeah, it's, it's hard. And the other thing too, is that you can program, computers for for all of these scenarios but you can't ever you know take into consideration every scenario like like the sioux city iowa one right remember where the mm -hmm. engine exploded took out all the hydraulic system they land the thing using differential thrust and like all of that like that i don't know if that's a that something that could be taken into account for the minuscule uh chances something like that could happen again but i don't know it, it will be interesting to see the evolution of it but there's there's a lot of things that the that the autopilot does better than we do. The autopilot holds out to you better than any of us can for sure. three hours. Like that's, yeah, that's never changed. And that's kind of the beginning of it. And it's just an evolution of that. So I think we have to realize our limitations and that we are certainly not better than, than computers at, at a lot. But, uh, 
we still have our place for now. Yeah, uh, I was also thinking too, you know, the other thing is, do you see it, Max? Do you think it's like a new tech, new air airframe that's developed where they're going, it's it's like an, oh, it's the 797, you know, single pilot certified or whatever. I obviously make that up, but, and then it's just like new aircraft that are being built. Or do you think there will be like a more of a development to retrofit existing airplanes? I think maybe initially it might be a new airplane that's like you said Mm -hmm. quickly followed by retrofit of existing airframes i mean i think there's been that thing you know boeing has already developed a standalone thing you can put into uh one of their products that will fly it yeah like it's not a new autopilot system it's a thing that you replace the with the seat yeah (laughs) and it, it it does it so I, I, I think it's what I think once there's acceptance that the big hurdle is going to be acceptance, right? By the public. And once acceptance is gained, then it's the floodgates open. I think. Yeah. So. That's what I've, cause I've always wondered, like in this particular situation, are you going to be quote unquote safer uh, from a job perspective in business aviation versus the airlines where you have a lot of like single operators and it's not like huge fleets. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. You know, I'm not I sure, felt- but you know what I would like to to understand is f- from somebody just to say, period, just like in the easiest way to ask the question, is it easier to develop automated self-driving cars or airplanes? Because we seem to be having a hell of a time getting that worked out with autonomy mm-hmm. i mean i just we we have laws here in arizona that are that are uh that are good for the the testing and development of these automated uh, you know self-driving cars so we see them here i think more than most and i saw one today yeah. my, one of my kids like what is that and it's got like you know things spinning oh yeah like the light corner yeah. of the car mm-hmm. and all and like it just doesn't seem like it's really right around the corner i mean my car it will stay in the lane and you know has radar cruise control like that that's even that's not perfect like I don't trust it <laughs> to stay unless it's like straight ahead highway. So, and I don't know the answer to that question because driving a car is very dynamic. There's stuff everywhere. Yeah. You're stopping and going all the time where reaction um, time is a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it just seems like we take dr- driving is very easy for all of us. Everybody does it. Nobody really thinks that much about it. And that's proving to be uh, more challenging than, you know, even Elon Musk, I think realize so it will happen one day but yeah yeah i've always that's been my my main question is like well would i be am i safer like quote unquote safer in a business jet just because of like it would be so like cost prohibitive to like retrofit most business jets of the existing fleet well no they're gonna have a a standalone and then whoever develops it it's probably garmin and then what they'll say is like oh we'll just lease you a automated pilot and it will cost you far oh. less than your human pilot. So we'll just lease it to you. That way you immediately cut your operating expenses by, you know, Oh, the robot, whatever. Okay. And we'll just come install the robot for you. And you just, you know, text it where you want to go. And the robots on the phone with Hertz, but you're on your own for the catering. That's the bad yeah. news. The catering in the rental car. Yeah. That's still, you're going to be in trouble. All right. Well, uh, I, I really like that email. I, I love it when we get, uh, different points of view from our listeners after listening to, to, to a segment. So Rob, thank you so much for the perspective. Um, I love it when people challenge uh, what we're talking about on the show. So keep those emails coming. I think it always helps us in our, in our search to uh, kind of understand what the future is. So well done. If you'd like to write into the mailbag, feel free. You can just shoot us an email info at 21, five podcast.com. Or if you want to do it anonymously, anonymously visit our website 25 podcastcom click on the flight advice link and you can just send us an anonymous message that way thanks to advanced air crew academy for sponsoring the mailbag let's move on to segment number one with our friend diamond dog tim pope he's here to uh educate us a little bit on uh, what the airline pilots are doing with all their extra bucks okay max the saying I think is "mo money, more problems," right? Is that uh, that's what P Diddy says? 
Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. So I'm going to have to hand this over to you because I'm just a lowly corporate pilot. I don't have these kind of problems. But uh, our boy Tim yeah. Pope is rejoining us to, to talk about some of the the real first world problems that airline pilots are facing today. So uh, welcome, welcome back, Tim. Listen, Good to Dylan, see you. When you make when you're making as much money as an airline pilot, sometimes there's just you literally run out of. This is similar to Roger Reeves' problem when he was in business. <laughs> is he literally ran out of physical space to put this much money, you know, and mm -hmm. as an airline pilot, it's more of, it's not necessarily physical, more of a, a bucket situation of, you know, your buckets just keep overflowing and it's, you, you, you need more buckets to catch it all, you know? So Tim's going to tell us how the, uh, the smart people of the world are figuring that out for us. Hi, Tim. Welcome back. <laughs> hey guys. Yeah. Thanks for having me. The only, the, the buckets that, that Roger Reeves used though, didn't have tax on them. So that was, uh, <laughs> I don't know who wins here. Those were actual real buckets. <laughs> yeah. So talk to us about the problem and the solution here, Tim. That's what we, that's really the, the brass tacks here. Yeah. So we've talked multiple times on this show about uh, with airline pilots, they receiving the direct 16% contribution to the retirement plan. Uh, the problem is that you, you run out of space in the 401k. Right. So, you know, you're only allowed to put $66,000 in the 401k. And so what was happening is that as pilots, their income grew, the company had to cut them a check. And so they have to pay taxes, you know, on the dollars that they couldn't fit into the 401k. And uh, they have to pay dues, you know, on those dollars as well. So Delta has has given pilots uh, with the market based cash balance plan. And that's what we're talking about today. Uh, they've given pilots another tool to save for retirement, but also to, to answer that problem. So now with the market based cash balance plan for the pilots that uh, that opt into it, they have another home for those dollars. Those dollars are tax deferred. Right. So you're, you're no longer getting that check back. Uh, you're getting you're seeing a, a, a current day tax benefit and decreased taxable income. Uh, and then the dollars are also growing tax deferred uh, until you take them out to retire uh, in retirement. So it's kind of like having another account with the similar rules of a 401k. Right. Essentially, it's tax deferred. It grows tax deferred. You pay tax when you distribute it. W what's the difference? Yeah, that's right. So it is similar, um, except so with the 401k, I'm not, you know, getting the, the nuances right. But so the 401k is a defined contribution plan. So you're putting your, do your dollars in, right? Uh, but remember, this, this is that 16%. So with the market-based cash balance plan, it's a defined benefit plan. It's the company dollars. So it's that 16% that the company is funding it. In the 401k, you retain control of how to invest the money. But in the market-based cash balance plan, these pilots that opt in are not going to have that control. Uh, the funds are going to be professionally managed at a at a forty percent stock, sixty percent bond kind of allocation. Okay, so is that so? That's the total of the sixteen percent of the company side of the contribution, or is it just the overage once you hit sixty six thousand dollars? Yeah, so it's the it's the overage. Okay. Um, so re refer to a spill cash. And I think that that is important. And Delta said about 70% of their pilots are, are receiving spill cash today. So this solution is, uh, it's a solution for a lot of pilots, right? And, you know, the number that, you know, that you're hearing and when you're reading online is 330,000, right? Delta can only put 16% of the first $330,000 into my 401k. But the reality is if the pilot is maxing out their own 401k, they're going to start to receive spill cash, you know, the next dollar above 272,000. So it's, it's a little lower than that 330, but to max your point, it's only the extra. And the reason that there's a lot of buzz right now is because Delta pilots have a one-time irrevocable decision of, should I opt in to the market-based cash balance plan, or should I just keep doing it business as usual? One of the things, I don't know if you would know this, but the, it, like, why do they cap the 401k at that $66,000 if there's another method of deferring that in, you know, deferring the tax on that income kind of similar to a 401k? Do you, what's the logic on that? Do you have any idea? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but the, these are, 
they're two separate parts of the IR, um, internal revenue code. So section 401k deals with this, which is the money that you and I can put in. And then these defined benefit plans are more, more akin to like the old school pensions where the company is funding it. Okay. Um, so they're two separate parts of the internal revenue code, but I don't, you know, I don't know the nuances of, of why the caps are where they are. And just so the listeners understand too, what's the alternative? If you opt, if you're a Delta pilot and you opt not to do the, market-based cash balance plan option, then what happens? I just want to explain it to everyone. Yeah. So if you, if you're Delta pilot and you uh, indicate that, Hey, this is not for me, I want to continue doing business as usual. What will happen is that it, you're going to continue to receive your spill cash as you do today, which is going to be taxed at whatever your marginal tax rate uh, is. And you're also going to pay out the dues, right? And you will not have a, a, an opportunity in the future to change your mind and say, "Hey, you know what? I'd like to I, I'd like to to go into the market based cash balance by now." So um, again, that's you know that the tax challenge is you're receiving you know you you can receive a, a decent amount of money on top of that that's being taxed at your marginal rate, uh, and there's nowhere you know you're just, you're just going to get taxed on it at the top rate of whatever you are. So, so give us an example, Tim, maybe if, if you can, what pilot would want to do that? Like, wouldn't everyone want to go into this market-based uh, cash balance plan? Or are there some scenarios that come to mind of, of folks that might be smart to opt out? Yeah, so that I, that's, a, that's a really good question. Like I said, I think that the, the plan will help a lot of people. There's a few scenarios um, that I can think of where a pilot may not want to opt into the market-based cash balance plan. Uh, as you recall, I said, you know, you don't have any control of the investment inside the market-based cash balance plan. It's going to be, I, ca I call it like a, a moderately conservative mix at 40% stock and 60% bond, right? So if you're somebody who is already engaged, maybe you're an active trader, uh, maybe you invest in business opportunities or real estate or something like that, um, and you have a, a track record of doing better than a 40% stock or 60% bond mix, um, then you might say, hey, you know what, I'm just I'm going to pay the taxes today. I'm going to take these dollars and I'm going to continue to invest them the way I was doing. Um, so that might be somebody that, uh, that you know, is, is savvy in their own right. Um, another thing is somebody might have very specific inheritance uh, planning needs. Uh, so now I'm thinking about funding specific trust for, for some reasons. Um, maybe they're special need kids. Maybe you you want to. You know, you're thinking about that next generation and you don't want them to have a compressed distribution schedule because uh, this market based cash balance plan, it will be qualified funds in retirement or at age 59 and a half. You will have the ability to move it over to an IRA. And so if you're thinking beyond myself as a current user, hey, I'm never going to use these dollars and I'm setting them up for a very specific purpose. It may make sense to to keep them non qualified. Uh, and then if you have other very specific non-retirement goals, maybe large non-retirement goals that you need to fund prior to retirement that you were expecting or planning on using the spill cash for. You've already factored in, you know, the after-tax amount and things like that. So those could be some reasons why folks uh, wouldn't, you know, use the market-based cash balance plan. Okay. So you use the spill cash to buy a boat. I got it. I, I got what you were saying without <laughs> saying it. Yeah. <laughs> I follow. So, well, I think this is interesting, you know, for, for folks that are listening going, well, why are we talking about this just for Delta? You know, what are we seeing in, in the marketplace right now? All the other carriers are saying we want the Delta contract plus a dollar or, you know, or plus Delta plus, you know? And so it's probably not out of the realm of possibility that Delta is going to be the only carrier with an option like this, right? Like we could see this at maybe all of the major carriers soon. Oh, for sure. Um, I, you know, all eyes on Delta, right? We're starting to get a lot of movement right now. We're, we're seeing movement with the American contract. We're seeing movement with FedEx, um, you know, United and, and Southwest still, still to be uh, de determined there. But it is very reasonable that at the majors that this model could be used um, across the board. I mean, uh, you know, at the majors, everybody's getting, you know, the non-elective contribution 16% and higher right? or yeah. higher in the future. Right. Is this about the only way that it can get done? Like with the spill cash, is this, a, this the, the, the typical vehicle that would be used for this? 
You know, on that, I'm not sure either. There's there's a whole lot of uh, analysts and, and attorneys and things that study right. the defined benefit, you know, uh, laws and things to figure out you know, how how to craft these plans. So I'm not sure about what are what other alternatives there would be to defer compensation yeah. until retirement uh, and then pull it out in that way. I do know that there's some plans that can be um, pretty pretty complex that are used in other other industries. Uh, but I'm, I'm not the expert there on plan design. Right. Well, it sounds like a big decision coming up for uh, Delta pilots. Uh, like you always say, Max, stick to what you know best and let the pros help you uh, decide uh, what you should do with do with your cheddar. I think to your point, it, it is a big decision. I've had multiple conversations uh, with Delta pilots. And I think, right, if you're a Delta pilot, yeah, and you're a DI, DIYer, like when it comes to investments, there's a lot of resources. A lot of people are talking about this online, so you should be able to find something. If you're a Delta pilot and you have an advisor currently, you should be having conversations and your advisor should be talking to you about your decision, particularly where you fall in your career, right? Like if you, you know, if you're later in your career, right, and you're at your top earning dollars, like you, should, you guys should be having conversations. Uh, and then, of course, for, for Delta pilots that are looking to partner with somebody to talk about this, plus the rest of their, their financial planning uh, needs, we're certainly open and, 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 um, and ready to have that conversation. But the other thing I would say is that there is a tax challenge on both sides of the coin, whether the pilot opts in or out. Uh, I've I've come on the show and I've beat the drum about a ticking time bomb when it comes to taxes, right? And the thing with the market-based cash balance plan is I do think it has the potential for that, right? You get that huge tax deduction today, but those funds are just going to grow, right? You can't opt out. Uh, there are some levers that you can pull to control somewhat how much money that goes in, primarily by your own 401k contributions and things like that. But, you know, a 20 or 30 or 40 year career could create this ticking tax time bomb. And so I think that uh, the challenge there is just is, is figuring out ways to manage that. But then on the flip side, the same challenge is the, the taxes as well, figuring out how to, how to manage that tax liability when you get that cash in hand. So those are, um, you know, you, you, you're going to have the same tax challenge regardless of where you go. Ticking tax time. That's why I'm staying in business aviation. I'm just avoiding time That's bombs. Right, you don't need to worry about these massive 401k problems. Safe. The rest yeah. of this happens. Yeah. That's true. No. That's good. Nope. I'm just gonna, just gonna keep buying. Uh, you know. Uh, Bitcoin. And, uh, just... That's good. Like, like we said, focus on what you know, Dylan, and uh, yeah. leave the rest to us, okay? Exactly. Exactly. Well, Tim, we always appreciate your expertise. And I know folks, uh, especially Delta pilots right now that need some guidance, um, you'll be able to find a link to Tim's calendar in the show notes. You can get on the schedule. And uh, Tim, uh, before we let you go, I, the rumor is uh, you just passed your instrument written. Is that true? I did. Okay. <laughs> I did pass the instrument written. That's right. Now I am uh, finding very expensive barbecue, you know, a couple hours away to go and, and partake and then come back home working on that cross country PIC time. I, so. no, okay. I, I, my question to you, are you a hood guy or a foggles guy? So foggles is what I've, what I've got access okay. to. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. It's a classy. I like that. The foggles, the hood is just so old and outdated <laughs> at this point. Yeah. Yeah, like oh my word! So so we were fly, like we were just Friday. We were flying, and my safety pilot, like I'm under the hood, and I'm I'm like being a good you know student kind of thing, and I'm not looking outside. I'm not even taking peeks, and uh, and he's like, we were tracking weather, like before we took off to make it back. He's like, oh oh that looks pretty dark over there. Like, oh, I don't know. I wonder how far they went. Like, I don't, I don't have a Stratus or anything to connect to the iPad. And then, like, you feel the, the cockpit get cold because we, we're, you know, we're going under clouds and stuff. <laughs> and I'm getting nervous. I'm like, dude, like, just call up ATC and ask what's going on. <laughs> and he's like, so, so finally, I'm like, dude, just like, cause, and we hear, like, ATC diverting other people for weather and, like, and all that stuff. And I'm just, you know, holding my head. And, uh, and so he's about to call and then he, they tell us like, Hey, you know, like one, six miles, 20 miles in diameter, like to moderate, appreciate that. And so then we divert around. I'm like, bro, like, come on, like, let's, 
let's ask them like, <laughs> and note to self i can rip the foggles off yeah next time like just make sure he's I not, love, that's know. what i love dude he didn't even peek he's like nope not gonna nope, do not it cheating i'm doing it we are gonna fly <laughs> through this thunderstorm if we have yeah. to i'm not gonna <laughs> i thought you were gonna say the safety pilot said tim you can remove your foggles because we're actually in the clouds now <laughs> <laughs> well well so like in may that that did happen uh well it wasn't clouds but it was it was smoke it was just really bad smoke and she's like hey take the glasses off let's see what we're dealing with right now. <laughs> that's how tim five finds that barbecue he's talking about he just follows the smoke <laughs> oh i smell the brisket come left i logged a point three and got some Enemy great team. pulled pork just send until you smell the pulled pork and we're gonna... <laughs> i love it that's how they do cross-country flying in the south yeah. dude it's great <laughs> The smoke us, the smoke us. Oh, I love it. Well, we'll keep us posted on your training, Tim. Um, we're excited for you. Do you think would you project you'll be done with your instrument by the end of the year? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think okay. that can happen. If you live in the south, you can fly an approach just based on the smell of the brisket, like an ADF. You know? <laughs> oh, we got to inspect it. Oh, oh, there's wind. We need a little. Uh, let's do oh, some crabbing. We, just... we need a bracket. Smells like we just crossed the uh, the barbecue pit. Turn left to a heading of 080 and start your time. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tim. If folks want to get a hold of you, the link is in the show notes. Appreciate your expertise and uh, looking forward to the next up- instrument flying update with you. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Tim, the wizard of financial knowledge for uh, setting things straight with the market-based plans that are coming to fruition. Next, we have the Space Force. Let's just jump right into it. Let's go. Max, we're so excited today. Uh, Major Casey Lawler of the U.S. Space Force is joining us to teach us about Space Force. But more importantly, I think, an even more important credential, she's an Embry Riddle Prescott alum. Yeah, go Eagles. Go Eagles. Welcome to the show, Ooh. Casey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> so, Casey, we have so many questions for you because I think like like many uh, folks, we don't know what much about Space Force. And um, so we're excited to learn a little bit about it and maybe see if there's any tie-ins to aviation. Um, it it kind of seems like there's some uh, natural tie-ins, but uh, just curious to learn a lot from you today. So if you could just start, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, how you got started and how you've ended up in Space Force. Sure. I Like you said, I am a Embry-Riddle alum. Um, I originally started in fall of 2007 as an aeronautical science major. Um, That was around the first pilot uh, hiring shortage. So I spent the first half of my first semester with no flight instructor doing uh, ground school and kind of trying to figure out what it was I was trying to do. Then once I finally got my instructor, everything that I was learning in ground school was round dials and we had just upgraded to glass cockpit. So I was super confused. And by the time spring semester rolled around, I just, I discovered that flying, I, while I enjoy general aviation, I enjoy flying as a career. It wasn't something I wanted to do. So I changed to aeronautics my second year and basically built the rest of my degree out of aviation safety classes. Um, and then I, I took a minor in Chinese, which serves uh, into how I ended up in Intel. Because when I went to fill out my dream sheet, um, for what I wanted to commission into in the Air Force, because it was also in the Air Force ROTC program, there was no aviation safety option. Um, so I chose Intel since I had taken classes with the GS- GSIS students as well and figured, well, if I've studied Chinese, then I'll probably look at China in some form or fashion, which has come into play quite handy now mm. with where we are 13 years later. And when I went to Intel school, the Air Force and all of their infinite wisdom went, you have a aeronautics degree, you focused on aviation, you focused on aviation safety, we will send you to Buckley Air Force Base, now Buckley Space Force Base, um, to do the Sibbers mission, which I was like, I don't even know what Sibbers is, I can't spell it, it's spelled S-B-I-R-S, not S-I-B-I-R-S, like you would okay. think. So I said, no idea what that is. Space in my Intel tech school was one day 
Um, I remember it being like 150 page or slide PowerPoint briefing um, in a course that was seven months long. So (laughs) very, very, very small emphasis on space in the Air Force when I first started out. So that's what took me off on the path of space as I I started out there my very first assignment in my career. Wow. So so can you explain Uh, what Cybrus is? Sure. So Sivers is a um, space-based infrared system. So essentially what it is, is it's a giant infrared um, telescope out in uh, geo orbit. So think as far out in space that its period of orbit around the Earth is the same amount of time that it takes the Earth to rotate. So it's, it's just under 24 hours. So we have to do some minor station keeping to keep the satellites on their position. Um, for the most part. Uh, so they sit there and they monitor the Earth. So they, they're all around the geo belt. There's these giant satellites. They're huge, um, like the size of a school bus. And they watch for heat signatures from um, rocket launches and provide missile warning. So for the Air Force and now Space Force, they're one of our probably most important missions is uh, missile warning. Think strategic ballistic missiles, the nukes are flying mm. type mission. So it's, it was born out of the cold war and has continued into more of the types of rocket launches we see today, which are much smaller, not as much strategic ballistic missile firing happening. Thankfully. Okay. Now I have a question. <laughs> if MH370 ex- would have exploded, would you have seen it? So love that question. It's actually one of the things that I wrote down because I was at Buckley when that happened. So I was actually, I was on my, the day it happened, I was on my way home to Denver from Korea about to board a flight flying back across the Pacific when the initial news reports were that a plane was missing, taken off out of Malaysia. I'm like, fantastic. I'm in Korea. I'm very close (laughs) to that. And there were two people, I don't know if you remember in the very early stages, but there were two people with stolen passports is what they were initially Mm -hmm. um, talking about. So I'm I'm thinking, oh my gosh, is this in the back of my mind being an Intel person? Is this some kind of terrorist thing? Like what's, what's going on? However, yes, to answer your question, it depends. So infrared is only as good as cloud cover and where it, where it occurs. Um, So to tie it into aviation, if it were to have exploded, it is a very high likelihood that we would have seen it um, take the second Malaysia air over Ukraine. That was a huge explosion because it was shot down and there was a missile that was fired associated with it. Um, So that one, um, I I was at Buckley when both of those happened. Um, Wow. (laughs) So very near and dear to my heart in aviation and kind of anytime there's any, like we might've shot down a commercial airliner, which unfortunately has happened more than once in the last decade. Uh, My mind immediately goes back to Buckley and like, what were the conditions? Would would we have been able to see it? Is the missile big enough for the, because the systems are, are built for strategic missiles. So much bigger. um, And it depends on the, amount of time it burns and where it is over like if there's cloud cover if that cloud is high enough then you may or may not actually see the the missile in its burn stage or be able to type it to the right type of missile i was wondering if the the heat signature on your radial engine would have been hot enough for her to track on that day max has a little personal (laughs) airplane and runs pretty hot i but uh, okay. probably no, not. Right. We're not okay. probably not tracking. You. All right. That, that was a question from Max's wife. She wrote in on that. And <laughs> want to keep tabs on them. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So I imagine, you know, the air force was not originally the air force, right? It was a, it was a part of the army. And then they said, you know what, we're using more and more of the air force. We should give them their own branch. Is this kind of how space force worked too? The air force was doing a lot of this work. And then they said, eh, we should make our own thing. Essentially, yeah. So if you look back in in history, um, so, so my second assignment, I actually taught Air Force history back at Embry-Riddle in the AFROTC program. Oh. So I spent a lot of time looking at kind of and kind of how the Air Force stood up, how it broke off from the Army, mm-hmm. and how there's a lot of very similar parallels to what happened with the Space Force. And it comes down to, at the time that aviation was dawning, um, think between World War One and World War Two, 
if you look at our initial requisitions for what we thought an aircraft could do, at first we're thinking, oh, okay, an aircraft is an extension of a dirigible or a balloon and it's straight ISR. We're just going to go and we're going to see what's going on and then report back. And then somebody has the bright idea of, well, if I'm over enemy territory, I can bomb mm. them. And then, so now we're flying past each other, waving, giving the good old pilot <laughs> salute as we're going to bomb each other's territory until somebody has the bright idea of what if I shoot at that guy so he doesn't bomb my stuff. <laughs> so it's a very slow mm-hmm. evolution of army thinking, which is ground, 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 ground. How do I protect the ground to what can air power actually provide and what does leveraging air power provide to a military? And when, when you have control of the sky, you have control of pretty much everything. Same thing with space. Um, space to the point where, like, for career development within the Air Force, we had what was called 13 Sierras, the specialty code, which were space operators. And there was only so far a 13 Sierra could progress on up. Like, if basically, in the Air Force, if you are not a pilot or, you know, a pilot of some sort, you're never going to be the chief of staff of the Air Force. Like, you're just, you're not. So no matter what you did in the Air Force, you're never going to be the chief of staff. At least historically, we've never had somebody who wasn't a pilot Mm -hmm. because it's the Air Force. So a 13S, never going to be chief of staff. 14N, never going to be the chief of staff. I mean, Intel 14N. Um, So the other issue that we had was similar to the Air Force is the way that the Army was looking at aircraft when we first broke or before we first before we broke off is we thought, okay, I need to get this airplane from point A to point B. So our initial requisitions were for aircraft that we could take the wings off of, put them on a truck or a train and transport them instead of building aircraft that had the legs to fly from point A to point B. Um, Again, with space, our first kind of wars and conflicts where space is really starting to come into play have been in about the 2020, the the, the 2000s. So think like early desert storm and then Iraq and Afghanistan, obviously hugely starting to leverage GPS guided bombs and, um, you know, space enabled movements on the ground um, and ISR really starting to come into play. But we're still looking at it from how does the satellite service the aircraft or the people on the ground um, and not really like what does space provide to the entire joint force? So that's where you start to get your tipping point of, holy cow, space is not just providing effects to the Air Force. Space is providing effects to all of the services, and we really need to have a seat at the table for advocating for um, upgrading our technologies and our capabilities so that we can provide that support in the event of um, some kind of conflict. So, like, conflicts nowadays, I mean, you look at... um, when Ukraine first kicked off, like we saw huge, huge um, changes in like, what's the first thing that Russia did? They, they started trying to jam communication so that the Ukrainians couldn't communicate. So then SpaceX provides the Starlink terminals to provide communication capabilities to the Ukrainians. Um, that's what space provides to the joint war fight. Like we provide more than just, satellites taking pictures if we provide stuff to all of the services and all of the joint chiefs are starting to have that realization um that space is incredibly important it needs to have that seat in order to advocate for itself and to advocate for the entire joint force mm. wow it's really long no, I mean, it's, it's really i mean because it is it's like this can of worms like you say you open it and then you're like oh wow but, but we need this mm-hmm. too i mean just when you mentioned gps as professional pilots, we are so reliant on right. GPS um, yep. and our infra- national infrastructure, uh, airlines. I mean, if there's GPS outages, the airlines would grind to a halt almost. Mm-hmm. So can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about GPS and specifically, uh, like, G- uh, is part of the mission to defend those satellites? Is that even possible? How well, does that That was my question. Yeah, yeah, like the vulnerabilities. Well, so. GPS is really interesting, too, because GPS was initially created to be a solely military um, capability. Mm-hmm. It wasn't it wasn't initially created to serve the first American people and then the global population. It was a solely military capability of providing blue forces right. tracking. 
at a more high fidelity level. Um, and now it has become the Air Force and then now the Space Force providing this capability, which enables everybody to do basically mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like GPS is such a huge part of our life that if, if my GPS doesn't work, I can't even get around the NCR and I've lived here for six <laughs> years. <laughs> like, I'm in trouble. I go back to the days of printing MapQuest yeah. maps and trying to get somewhere. Um, so, yeah, like that's that's probably the first thing that we think of when we think of space. We think of GPS. And then you have to think of, okay, what else do I use that leverages space? And it's it's pretty much everything nowadays has some kind of technology capability, like down to your car. Certain cars if you don't have communications with a satellite, it might not Mm -hmm. even go like you fly fry the electronics on that car and it's not going to start. Um, so like your, your communications, like your ACARS messages that come across, you know, those use VHF and, um, I think VHF and EHF frequencies. So they're either going line of sight or they're going to a satellite to your aircraft. Uh, the second, you know, back to the Malaysia air, the fact that in was that was that one in 2014? I think so. Yeah, I just watched the Netflix. In 2014, we could lose a triple seven. <sighs> yeah, over the Pacific, just blows my mind. And it's because satellite coverage. We don't have the same amount of satellite coverage over the South right. Pacific that we do over densely populated areas. Like that's everything that you do relies on something seeing mm-hmm. you or some way to check in. If it's, if you're over vast expanses, you better hope there's a satellite or something for your aircraft to check in with. Um, otherwise we may not know where right. you are. Yeah, it's, I was trying to explain this to my kids who are both huge Top Gun Maverick fans and they you know, they watch the dark star <laughs> airplane like, things so cool. And I'm like, I don't even know if that, kind of thing is necessary anymore um, due to a lot of what we're talking about with with satellites and and mm-hmm. but at the same time that's a new vo- attack surface right it's a new vulnerability and mm-hmm. so beyond m- monitoring just ballistic missiles you guys I imagine are also having to try and figure out how do we protect these assets in space right right that's that's going to be a whole nother And that's, thing, that's yeah. another aspect is that space as a domain has been thought of as, um, as largely benign scientific. Mm-hmm. Most people before probably the Space Force stood up wouldn't have even put a thought to the fact that there were space missions within the military yeah. services. Like, you, like most people would not have put thought that there are space operators that are flying, flying air quotes satellites um within the air force or that you know there's operators operating different types of ground system radars um in the army that the navy probably the biggest user of space and satellite communications had no space specialty Hmm. within it which just you know blows my mind um you know space and cyber are very very intricate 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 i can't say that word intricately <laughs> very much in, entwined yes. sorry intimately entwined <laughs> intimately um so no it's, it's just interesting like you say you know it's it, there's the military so dependent on it so i remember 2019 um donald trump yeah. was in office i think and he was the one that sort of announced right space force that we're creating um there might have been one or two memes floating around on the internet, kind of making fun of that and being like, this is why, why are we doing this? You know? And, um, so, but, but when you stop and think about it, like you're saying, we have so much tied up in space. This, this makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And I'm actually reading a thesis by uh, someone in space force named Jason Lowry right now. And he's talking about like power projection technologies and how mm-hmm. when you're projecting power into a new space, sometimes it doesn't make sense at the beginning because, um, it's hard to see kind of into the future how this technology is going to be used. But forward thinking folks like 
um, our military uh, um, are, are realizing that this is sort of, I, I hate to say space in the next frontier to steal from <laughs> Star Trek, but it <laughs> right. kind of feels that way. Um, it, and so do you find that people are, it's clicking with more people or are people still thinking like you're launching to the moon next week and they're making fun of that? Like, I mean, what's that like? <laughs> Yeah, so I would say that that's probably still one of the biggest confusions. Like, why does the Space Force not have astronauts? Yeah. Um, and um, we, we, we have a couple because we pushed them from the Air Force, um, but they're setting up a lot of our training ranges and stuff. They're not, and, and then they'll go back to NASA. So, like, every military service has their own astronauts, um, mm-hmm. but then we farm them out to NASA. So they're like, they, they become their own kind of core within the service if you will and then like there it's it's a really really fascinating how the different services develop their astronauts um but within the space force and to go back to your point of like power projection we we have a lot of people focus on Mm sci-fi when they think the space force and so they think oh well all of your stuff copies battlestar galactica for our uniforms or star trek and the delta shape and it's like well if you look back in history the original um u.s space command that that was their their delta shape guardians of the high frontier was the motto not guardians of the galaxy (laughs) so like you know we, we we kind of revisit these things like will the space force eventually have astronauts and travel interplanetary who the yeah. heck knows we you know we've got to first figure out how we get past the um outer reaches of earth orbit and not irradiate our astronauts and have them die within you know right. a very short period right. of time um you know before we can even start projecting that what what mainly we're focusing on and from a power projection standpoint is that space as a domain is no longer benign. You've got bad actors in space building and doing things largely out of sight of the average observer because they can. And because the average, I would say the average American, but the average person probably on this planet has no idea what's orbiting above their heads at any given period of time. Um, and doesn't pay two thoughts of it until they see, you know, maybe the occasional satellite reentry that breaks, you know, that causes streaks across the sky. And I get a text from my sister in California and she's like, holy cow, what is this? It's a rocket body or it's some kind of satellite that broke up. Did you know this happened? I'm like, well, satellites and space junk deorbits at least hmm. once a week, little pieces of something. Um, and you just don't think about it because the earth is 70% water. So most of that stuff happens over water, but the amount of stuff that's up there and the things that cause concern for a military perspective is part of the reason why the space force exists because most of what we've pretty much everything we've got up there that we've launched, we didn't build it with any kind of capability to defend Mm -hmm. itself because it didn't need to. And now we're in a domain and we're in an era where that's not the way our adversaries think anymore. And so we've got to think, okay, how do we advocate for the stuff we have on orbit? How do we advocate for protecting it so that we can enable the joint force in the event of a conflict? Because it's going to start probably in space before you start seeing anything else happening. So talk to us about the militarization of space. Because there was a treaty back in the 60s, right, that was supposed to prevent that. Well, so the mil- <laughs> the militarization of space, the treaties that you're referencing reference nuclear weapons. And it's the whole reason why ballistic missiles exist, because the treaties that we have been signatories to say that we will not put nuclear weapons in orbit. So that's why ballistic missiles, they can transfer, they transit through yeah. an orbit, but they come back down right. to Earth and they don't make a full orbit. So therefore, by definition and by default of the treaty, they don't break any rules. Um, so militarization has never, or the lack of militarization has never really been agreed upon, um, by any country. Okay. Okay. So, so that being said though, uh, the, a lot of militaries have offensive space capability and the ability to shoot down a satellite, um, which we've seen in the news. And, and so, you know, it would seem in some sort of large scale conflict. Yeah. Like you said, that, that would be the first thing because the intelligence gained from the space assets is so huge and the capability that that's where they would. So 
we know that people that other countries in a large scale conflict, you know, big um, powers have the ability for to shoot down satellites. They have offensive weapons for that. So, so what what is this? What are we doing about that? And and to prevent all of our intelligence satellites and GPS and everything else from being taken out in the early stages of a large scale conflict. And like, what's the, what's that look like? Uh, so there's a couple of different um, theories that like scales of thought. So when you think about like, how do I defend myself from a missile, from a military perspective, once a missile has reached a certain speed and terminal point, you're not going to really shoot. Like you're shooting a missile down at end stage is not really a viable option from a military standpoint currently. Will there be capabilities down the line? Who knows? Um, that's physics that are beyond my brain power. <laughs> we'll have to ask Chat GPT. Yeah. yeah we'll there you go. Yeah, ask Chat GPT. Since AI is intimately involved. <laughs> um, so then you're you start to consider, okay, well, how do I defend myself? And there's a lot of different schools of thought. One of the the current schools of thought is just by um, large like large um, densely populated constellations of something. So Starlink is proving this excellently with how many satellites they're launching. And in order to take down Starlink, you've got to take down thousands of satellites. So it becomes not military, not military viable standpoint or perspective basically to shoot down these satellites. Um, And most of quote, the shoot down that we're talking about is in Leo Um, So then you have the other issue of as you start to shoot at satellites within LEO, the interesting orbit, sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. The low earth orbit, which is where the majority of like those communication type satellites and the internet satellites and and, and stuff that I was referencing live. um, Just because you shoot down a satellite doesn't mean that that satellite goes away. That now becomes hundreds to thousands of little pieces and particles Mm. that as it spins around the earth populates and fills up that orbit. And then you become, you, you start to have to worry about a debris, um, debris causing issues to other satellites. So something as small as a paint fleck. I don't know if you remember the paint fleck that hit the, the, um, space shuttle window, the damage that that caused. So something as small as a paint paint flat can cause that kind of damage to a space shuttle window, then anything larger or piece of a broken up satellite is going to take out other satellites as it continues to orbit around. Um, so it becomes, there's the potential theory that it'll snowball and make the entire orbit non-viable mm. because then it could take decades to hundreds of years for all of that stuff to slowly start coming back in <laughs> into earth's orbit. So the difference in space versus the air and the Navy is if I shoot down an aircraft, that aircraft falls out of the sky and it no longer becomes a problem for me have to have to think about how do I navigate around the debris that was mm-hmm. that aircraft. I can continue to fly in that same domain. If I sink, shoot down, shoot a ship or with a torpedo or something, it's going to sink. And now that sea lane is back open. If I shoot down a satellite, that debris could be there potentially for the rest of, like, if you shoot a satellite in geo, it's reasonably not really ever coming back because <laughs> wow. you're talking like 30, 40,000 kilometers out. Wow. It's that, I mean, and this is another point of like, there's so much that we don't grasp mm-hmm. All with space that it's just so hard for the ordinary person to even, I, I imagine just That's the little rocker of, space is hard. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Right. Exactly. Did Elon Musk say that? It sounds like that, that sounds like something he would <laughs> I think say. It was um, okay. <laughs> so give us the top five most annoying questions you get asked or repetitive questions that people ask you about space and space force so that we know not to ask these if we meet. We've probably already asked Guardian. three. Yeah, we've already asked three. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that there's like any like top five most annoying. It's like, yeah. are you an astronaut? Have you gone right. to space? When are you going to space? Mm-hmm. Kind of all that. Yeah. That lack of thinking. Why does the space right. force exist? Um, to which I kind of say, well, do you have a cell phone? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you like right, to use exactly. your cell phone? <laughs> How did you navigate to where you're at? Um, right. 
Yeah, no, it's it's more so just I think the biggest issues for for me is the lack of understanding between U.S. Space Command and U.S. Space Force because both of them stood up so close to each other. Mm. So the U.S. Space Command is the combatant command, which is in Colorado Springs currently. So the the head of the Space Force is one of the members of the Joint Chiefs. Gotcha. And we fall underneath. We're not our own service. We fall underneath the Department of the Air Force since we broke off of the Air Force. So I think okay. that's probably my biggest, I would say, pet peeve is the lack of understanding of what the differences are, which arguably it's because it's confusing. But most people will be like, oh, you live in Colorado. No, we're in Washington, D.C. We are a military service. We are not a combatant command military service for the dis- distinct the distinction of military services organize train and equip forces for which to leverage to the combatant commands to wage war so mm. we buy the stuff we train the people we get all the equipment ready and then we give them to the combatant commands so i think centcom centcom waged the wars in iraq and afghanistan u.s space command has the quote potential future space war and they would pull in members from all of the different services with the expertise with which to operate the combined space operations center or whatever you know we have an aoc so i would imagine it would be something along those lines um Hmm. So it's going to be a while. It's going to be a while. Is what you're saying before <laughs> people p- p- people grasp us. Now, internally, if you make a mistake, is there any type of inside joke about getting transferred to a moon base or anything like that? They don't know. Okay. <laughs> <Jeez. laughs> you what? You know, I, I have to apologize I, for him. He watched yeah. a lot of Star Trek when yeah. he was a kid. He's one of those yeah. guys. I, I appreciated the Space Force Netflix show for what it was. Did you? Having, okay. having been in the military now 12 and a half years, it's a great representation of just the general shenanigans that is the military as a whole. So, right. so it's good. Okay, so I, I think if it I doesn't an make two, any sense, then that's probably what we're doing. <laughs> then there we go. <laughs> so the Space Force actually does have spacecraft, right? Like the X-37 was transferred from the Air Force to the Space Force. Is that correct? Um, I mean, technically, satellites are spacecraft. The X-37 doesn't mm. hold people. So if you think of something with which to hold people, no. Okay. Um, it can't does it can't does it not have the capability to hold people or just they just don't? I have no she idea. That, she's giving you the I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Look, you know? I'd have to send the space laser down on you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the space force. As far as do you guys have multiple bases? What are some of the different areas that people can serve in? Mm-hmm. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so we have um, five main bases. Uh, So we have, or main kind of basing areas. You've got Vandenberg Space Force Base, which is in California. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know where Lompoc is. Yep. So it's in Lompoc, California. Um, And there there are West Coast missile launch and then um, a couple of other different types of space missions out there, but largely known for their missile launch. Um, then Colorado is kind of the hub of, I would say the large majority of space missions. You've got Peterson, Schriever, Cheyenne Mountain, um, and Buckley. Then you've got Patrick Space Force Base in Florida. That's our East Coast launch. That's where the large majority of our, our launch missions are happening right now. Um, let's see, what did I leave out? What about the one that's right in LA, like right by L- Yeah, so LA Space Force Base. That's our. Thank you. That was that was one of those I, for, I was forgetting. Um, I drive by that one and I'm like, what? No, I haven't seen it's, that one. It's yeah. the weirdest uh, base because it's literally like it about a city, city block large, and it's where all of our acquisitions types activities. Um, so think building and acquiring um, and managing programs, different types of satellite hmm. programs. So. Um, their space systems command is out at LA space Force space. Uh, and then you've got like the Pentagon and then there's certain areas within there's like clear station, in Alaska. We've got what used to be Thule. Now we just renamed it to be in Greenland. Really? That's a space force space. Uh-huh. It's a well, it's space 
Space Force Station or Space Base. Okay. So my um, regular, my thing about that, that when they threaten to transfer you, it's not to the moon base, it's to Thule. It's, yes, to yeah, Thule. Okay. Yeah, we, we do make that threat, up. and we actually <laughs> sent one of our uh, traveling exec comm guys out there. Uh, he wanted to go. <laughs> <laughs> so that no longer an Air Force? It, no, it's no longer Air Force. Uh, it's a space mission. Um, it's very cold. It was just there last month. <laughs> Have you been there? Yeah, I was just there last month for the the renaming. Um, it's mostly daylight there now, but still, mm. I think it was about negative forty. Have, Casey, have you heard of the story of the keybird? No. Oh my god, oh, we wow. gotta send you. A link. We're gonna send you a link to this. <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> it's it's a very Thule centric okay. yeah, uh, story. Yeah. It's it's incredible. Yeah. We just talked about it on the last show. It's it's mind boggling. Awesome. Yeah, something to look forward to on your next long layover in. In, uh, it's only an hour. What's it called? Key duck? No, B duck? Yeah, it's spelled like Patufik, but um, pronounced by the Greenlanders as Bidufik. 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 Interesting. Well, yeah. How come they changed the name? So when we took over the area in the 1950s, we forcefully relocated the um, Inuit people who lived there. And so it's, it's an act of goodwill now that we are renaming it as a space base anyways, um, but also to continue. So one of the, one of the lines of effort within the military is partnering to, or the space force is partnering to win. So because um, space is so hard, having partners with which to leverage should a space war or a war pop off, um, we will need all of our, our, um, international partners. So it's, it's part of that kind of trying to rebuild relationships with the, with the Danes and the Greenlanders. Um, cool. So, Makes sense. Yeah. So, so let's say I'm a student right now, maybe I'm in high school or in college and I'm listening to this, going, oh, this is interesting. Like maybe Space Force is something that wasn't on my radar before and I'd be interested in checking it out. What are some of maybe, well, there's probably a couple different ways to look at this question. Um, First, how would you go about getting into the Space Force? You, are you an Air Force ROTC? Is that kind of the typical path or is there a new, like talk to us about that. Yeah, so you're going to start out in Air Force ROTC. Um, and I mm -hmm. think currently the way they're doing it is like their junior, senior year, they'll type into the Space Force. Um, and mm -hmm. that'll depend on degree program. It'll depend on the desire of the person. Like, um large majority of, of who we're bringing in are, are STEM type degree programs um, mm -hmm. because space is heavily STEM, STEM dependent. Um, so initially you're going to start out in Air Force ROTC. If you're coming out of high school and you want to enlist, then you're going to go meet with a, I think we've, we've got our own Space Force recruiters now, but depending on where you live, it may be an Air Force recruiter to hook you up with a Space Force recruiter. Um, and we're taking, so we are just about 8,000 active duty right now mm -hmm. in strength. Um, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. I don't know what the exact number is off the top of my head. Um, but we're bringing in about 500 enlisted and 500 officers a year. So 100 will come from the Air Force Academy. So they're going to be our academy as well, at least for the foreseeable future, similar to the way the Navy and the Marine Corps structure. Um so it's a, it's a good way to think of the Space Force is the Space Force is kind of like the Marine Corps to the Navy. The Space Force is mm -hmm. to the Air Force, like the Marine Corps is to the Navy. Um, I think eventually, you know, down the road, we might have our own Space Force ROTC. But right now we don't have the people to pull from our mission sets in order right. to staff those kind of functions. So we're relying on the Air Force and the way the, the Space Force stood up. We stood up with the Space Force will pull in the five core expertises we need. So that's Intel, cyber, space operators, engineers, and um, shoot, what's the fifth? Um, I don't know what the fifth one is. It'll come to me. Um, but your, your core kind of space missions and functions. Mm -hmm. And then the Air Force will service us for everything else. So think doctors, think personnel systems are still currently serviced by yeah. the Air Force. Um, anything that's not specifically just like a solely purely Space Force thing, the Air Force handles. Security forces oh. for our bases. That's all Air Force bodies. 
Gotcha. So I'm um, kind of when we think about what <laughs> – Uh, like a classic example of maybe a mission that you, or not a mission, but like a job you could have, like you you mentioned, oh, you could be an engineer maybe. Mm -hmm. And so you could have an engineering role. um, And then more of like, (laughs) oh, acquisitions. Okay. Um, So um, some cyber, so like if you're interested in like computer technology, there could be a place in Space Force Mm -hmm. for you. Obviously engineering. um, And then uh, what was it? SIGINT, you said, I think, or Signals Intelligence. Uh, Intel. So, or Intel, yeah, yeah, I mean, SIGINT is, is encompassed in Intel. It's one of the yeah. specialties. Um, but I think for the most part, well, yeah, I don't know how we shredded out the enlisted um, Intel functions, but I, I'm sure we've got, I, we definitely mm-hmm. have SIGINTers, just probably not as many as the Air Force does. So how does, what, what part does the National Reconnaissance Office play with satellites when now is there's a Space Force? <laughs> Yeah, so, um, did I lose you? No, Uh, we still got you. Um, So the NRO is, it's an interesting relationship because the NRO always kind of had their own, you've got NRO, you've got NGA, you've got all the other three-letter agencies that have their own types of missions, and then there's the Space Force. And in some ways we can communicate and collaborate, and in other ways we don't. Um, It's probably the... Best way I can define that. Kind of like all the other branches of the military, right? Yeah. Right. Some ways we communicate and collaborate. We're, we're, we're frenemies, <laughs> we right? No, no, I actually yeah. have a, we have a great, great relationship with the NRO. I don't want to say that. Um, <laughs> but it's more so kind of a relationship of convenience of where do we collaborate and where don't we. Like right. many relationships. Yes. It's complicated. Yeah, they, yeah. It's very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, last question um, on kind of on the career path. If somebody's interested in aviation, is there any, like, does it translate pretty well? Is there any specific roles in Space Force that you can think of that might have more of an aviation slant? Um, not really. Um, okay. Yeah. Would it be at this juncture if you want to position yourself for a potential opportunity would be to go to the air force and be a pilot and then kind of see something. Yeah. Cause that's where you would think if the space force had a need for pilots yeah. or astronauts or whatever, that's, where right? come that's from. kind of where they would come. Yeah. And I mean, like if you wanted to be an astronaut currently, you would have to join the air force. I would not say join the space force today. Mm-hmm. Um, will the space force of the future get there? I don't know. Um, but right now the way that the, at least the air force hires and trains astronauts, they come from pilots. So whereas the way NASA hires in, in, um, develops their astronauts, you can have any kind of specialty, but within the air force and the military, they're largely pilots, um, or like test pilot type things who get pulled over to be, or can apply and, and become astronauts. So when you're on the military base, do you ever have the Air Force, you know, Air Force pilots that have a little bit of swagger. Do you feel like you're kind of one up them? Like if they, oh yeah, I'm an Air Force pilot, you know, they kind of let you know. And then do you say, well, I'm in the Space Force. I'm like above you. Does that, is there, do you have any? Literally part? and figuratively. Yeah. I'm yeah. out of this like, world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's been waiting all day to drop that one. <laughs> Thanks for setting me up so perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no. So, I mean, I'm the pilots I, I work with in, in my current job, um, are not your typical pilots, I would say, cause we fly, um, the executive. They're humble. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're like the Gulfstream and the, um, so yeah, the, right. the Gulfstream and the C, uh, 737 type pilots. So most of them are actually right. reservists, uh-huh. um, who may, yeah. So. Okay. Casey. So you're at a family holiday dinner. <laughs> People are. Oh, they know you're in the Space Force. I imagine grandma goes, what is it exactly that you do? <laughs> right? I mean, you must get this question a lot. So how do you explain your role in the Space Force? Um, I mean, so right now I have a really unique role. Um, I am the aide-de-camp for the Chief of Space Operations. So essentially a super fancy way of saying that I work directly for um, General Saltzman and largely am in charge of anytime he's on travel. So anytime you see like he flew somewhere, like take it New Zealand in December, um, I'm there with him making sure all of his kind of keeping the schedule and keeping him on time, um, carrying all the stuff and (laughs) all the stuff and things. Um, (laughs) 
I'm a glorified pack mule. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But the really cool thing about that, and especially right now in the Space Force, is I'm getting a front row seat of everything that Space Force has to offer. So I get to go as he travels to the different bases, as he travels to the outstations. Um, We've stood up uh, our Pacific... uh, what do we what do we call it? Space Forces, uh, Dur Space Force um, in Europe, Director of Space Forces, and then our Pacific Space Forces uh, out in Hawaii. So I got to go for both of those stand up ceremonies, and then we've also brought on a lot of Army missions. So kind of seeing what some of those different missions look like as we bring them into the Space Force. So it's kind of like getting to walk in the initial stages of think you know tie it back to you guys. Think of the initial stages of the Air Force and kind of having a front row seat of all the different missions and the bases as we stood them up. Uh, so it's a it's a pretty wow. pretty unique and, and really cool job. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. That is is really interesting. And so, General Saltzman, you said it's the what's the term we use for the he's the, he leads Space Force, right? What yeah, is that so he's term? the chief of space operations. Chief of, of space operations, and is he the very first one, or have there been a couple? So of them? he's the second. General Raymond uh, was the okay. first, and they transitioned in November of last year. Okay. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And now, I, I did, uh, one thing I saw when I was reading about this is that you guys use the term guardian mm-hmm. a lot. Where did that come from? So, guardian. Who gets to be called a guardian? Yeah. So, anyone, just like an air, a airman is to the Air Force, a guardian is to the Space Force, or a soldier is to the Army, um, a Marine is to the Marines, sailor mm-hmm. is to the Navy. So, that's what we call all of our people within the Space Force. We're guardians. I would say that we're still developing kind of that culture. That's, that's probably the other question of like, what is the space force? What does it, what does it feel like to be in the space force? What does it mean to be a guardian? Um, so right now we have kind of the guardian ideal and what we call the four C's, the character, courage, commitment, and connection. Um, and we're honestly, the space force right now feels like, it feels like a startup um, mm. in a really cool way. So it's it's a lot of a lot of people who came over to the Space Force from the other services came over because we we had something. So I, I was in the Air Force for ten years before I transitioned to the Space Force. Um, so I and I I chose to come to the Space Force. I was not forced to come to the Space Force or apply because um, I'm I'm not a career space operator. I'm a career intel officer. Um, so it was a, it was a choice for me and it was an easy choice for me because I had only ever done space missions within the air force. Mm. So <laughs> my path on, on the air force side was really wonky. Um, but I felt like I had something I could provide to the space force as we stood up. And that's a lot of the feel of most of the guardians right now is we, we feel like we have an expertise or we have experiences from our various different services that we can provide to the space force to make it better and to kind of stand it up on the right foot. Um, so that's, so I, I kind of liken like the other military branches that have been around a long time to like big companies, mm-hmm. like GM or, you know, IBM or big companies that have been around for a long time and kind of do ways, things a certain way. And then startups are oftentimes different and more lean and, and kind of change things up. Do you see that, that the space force is going to be, different on how it's run and maybe more efficient than some of the other branches you know what do you see as it's kind of being stood up as you said yeah so absolutely we are absolutely more lean so like i was saying earlier we are only about eight thousand strong on the active duty side and then another eight thousand or so on the civilian side so sixteen thousand members in the space force as a whole compared to 600 and some odd thousand in the air force um so just like wow paling in comparison we're comparable to (laughs) some of our smaller european nations entire military sizes is the space force um so we are very small we are very flat in in the way that we've structured and organized and kind of stood up our different types of commands we've removed layers of command and layers of like people you have to if you're getting you guys kind of have a, a very similar chain of command of how you kind of communicate up. You don't just call the CEO of your company. Um, right. In the Space Force, there's very few layers between any one guardian and the chief of space operations. 
Um, and that's by design uh, because we are so small. Your youngest members should feel like they have a voice and can talk to senior leaders because that's who we need to hear from. Like they don't I really at 12 years in my career, I'm kind of becoming one of the old dogs, if you will. <laughs> and I need to hear from the, the, it sounds weird, but you know, you kind of get stuck in your ways. My, my ways in raising are very much in the air force ideas and mentalities and, and the space force is trying to get away from the way the air force did it. Um, yeah. but still kind of within that, that construct. So Cool. Well, it just seems interesting to me because your mission that you kind of think of it now, if we talk to you in 10 years, that could be completely different, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, more than other branches, I feel like you guys are so tied to technology. And, and, and I think that kind of leads into my next question. Starlink, mm -hmm. you mentioned it before. It's revolutionizing the battlefield, really, in a way, right? Um, and, and then you mentioned how there's almost a decentralization of the their um, satellites, right? So you can't just take out one satellite. But how has Starlink changed maybe Space Force or what has it taught you? I, can you talk a little bit about kind of your observations of it? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think we're, we're learning lessons from the way that Starlink is distributing things. And I, I do want to make clear, like, the Space Force is not, is not SpaceX right. and is not Starlink. Right, right. <laughs> Right, um, exactly. But, you know, there's a lot that we can learn from their methods and how quickly they're able yeah. to acquire and build satellites. Like the Space Force is still a member of the Department of Defense. We are still beholden to the way the Department of Defense constructs itself and to, you know, to Congress and to the people mm -hmm. as far as how we spend our money and how we acquire things. So there's still certain things that we are always going to be slower than the average startup or the average company, just by sheer fact right. that we are a military service. However, by cutting some of that bureau bureaucratic tape and by making our commands smaller, we are able to start moving things faster um, than your typical air force and other military service. So, but we're, we're always yeah. going to be slower and there. I think that's always going to be frustration, especially on the younger people, younger guardians and younger people coming into the space force. They come into the space force because we've said, Hey, we're a digital service and we're all, you know, it's all fancy, it's super exciting. And they're thinking star Trek <laughs> and we right, give them right. a, I, what is this? Like an iPhone 12 that's still operating the BlackBerry <laughs> interface. And you're like, I'm pretty sure the DOD is single-handedly keeping BlackBerry alive because who else uses a BlackBerry except for the DOD? Right. Um, so, <laughs> like, Wait, but, but it's an interface on an it's iPhone? It's awful. It is absolutely awful. <laughs> um, so it's like a BlackBerry app. It's a BlackBerry app. That's how we get our email. Um Oh but, my God! Do, I, do you still have that? What was the messaging? BlackBerry thing? Messenger. BBM, that was money. Yeah. That's the yeah, only thing. Do you have BBM yeah. still. So we don't have that. Uh, thankfully, we can text like a normal iPhone. Um, but we've uh, taken <laughs> we take things like an iPhone or an iPad and we make them compatible with the security apparatuses that are acceptable to a military standard. But in doing that, yeah. we slow things down. We break them, and what young people are coming into the Space Force thinking and what their impression is and what we actually are living in. <laughs> We're just we're not there yet it's going to take time you're gonna have to have patience you're gonna have to be willing to roll up your sleeves and deal through you know work through some of the kind of grunt work that is standing up service we haven't done this in 75 years right. um so like there is no rule book there is no this is how you do this we're we're just learning it as we go um so it's, it's exciting but it's very frustrating at times <laughs> Do you ever have any of the young people ask you if there's any work from home opportunities? All the time. All the time. We still, <laughs> uh, we still have people home. that are, that are teleworking <laughs> in, in various different methods and in career fields throughout like the entire DOD, um, just like the federal service does. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you guys can't also, work from home because slow to come back yeah. Yeah. to the office. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Slow to come back. Yeah. Um, so, okay. This might be a really dumb question. I guess if you have to go through the Air Force first, uh, 
are f- like the physical fitness requirements any difference in Space Force for that? If they, if we've got any couch potatoes that are listening and think they've they've got a shortcut, is that true? So it is a congressional mandate that military services will have a physical fitness assessment. So I want to you know throw that out there mm. that you're not going to come and be in a military service and not have a physical requirement of some sort. However. What I will say is wonderful about where we are currently is what the Space Force is trialing is wearables. And I've got my fancy oh, Garmin watch. There it is. Um, it's the, this is, the, I think, the Garmin Phoenix. Work. This is one of the early ones. And then we're rolling out some, some new uh, watches in the next couple of months that will be more available to, to more Guardians. This is, this is one of the early trials. Um, but what we're looking at is the physical fitness assessment as it stands in the military services is, is a snapshot of what I like to call in the Air Force. It's 15 minutes of my life once a year if I score a 90. Like, really, I can mm. pull my butt around the track six times and do some push-ups and sit-ups and be pretty out of shape. Um, you know, like, it's it's not that hard uh, to pass right. if you study for it, if you will. What the Space Force is looking at, because we are so small, we are able to do things differently, and we're, we're looking at what's called the holistic health assessment. So part of that is a wearable technology that, um, and we're still working out all of the, like, the data and what your commanders can see and what's punitive and what's not. And, mm. you know, there's, there's going to be probably years of figuring that out. Um, but we want to make and incentivize people being healthy and making healthy choices all year round instead of just right. in the month of, or the month before your PT test. Cause in, in the air force, like you go, Oh shoot, my PT test is coming up. And I'm sure the other services are the same way. Um, my, my PT test is coming up in a couple of months. So uh, I'm going to start cutting back the junk and start, you know, running after I haven't run in six months and doing some push ups before bed and making sure I'm good to go. And then as soon as you pass, you go and you eat an entire box of Oreos or like you're, you're not yeah. making consistent, healthy choices all year round. And it's not true for everybody, but I would say that it only incentivizes mm, a small drink. portion of the time for you to be fit. All right, Casey, I know I've learned a lot in this interview. I feel like I can articulate a little bit more about Space yeah, Force. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I like Guardians, who knew? Yeah, exactly. That's great. This is great. Oh, no, yeah, I, that was reminds me of a question. Because didn't the Washington football team just rename themselves the Guardians too? Did they? I know the Cleveland. Oh, Cleveland. Um, no, I'm sorry. It's yes. Cleveland. It's the baseball team. Yeah. Yes. Any tie over there to people wearing Guardians hats now to work? Um, oh, <laughs> no. So we actually, we went out, General Raymond threw out a first pitch there. I can't even remember what month it was last year. Okay. Maybe September, August, somewhere in there. So we went out to a Guardians game, which was pretty cool. Um, oh. And the the team themselves, you know, they were interested in kind of continuing that partnership. So, you know, maybe something coming on down the Could line be. later. Huh. Okay. If not, you know, just to have something that says Guardians for our future Guardians. Right. But. They ha- they haven't won a World Series yet, though, I don't think. Or it's been a really long time, so... Maybe this is the boost they need. Who knows? That's okay. Yeah, We're the we'll baby see. service, so we understand <laughs> underdogs. Yeah. You guys growing. <laughs> Grow together. Uh, interesting. Um, okay, so we'll get you out of here on the last question, um, Casey. Uh, well, go ahead, I have Max. a couple yeah. questions. Oh, so okay, traveling around as the aide de camp, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. you must go to some pretty cool places. Well, one, my question is, how are you guys traveling? Yeah, so is we a lot of travel. PJ travel involved? Is it a lot of what? PJ, private jet. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, think military private jet, so right, it's yeah. still, you know, of a military standard. Yeah, there's a radio operator and a flight engineer. And yeah. It sure is. So on the yes. <laughs> yes. Um, the little, the little, it's not a radio operator anymore. They're kind of a calm guy trying to keep us in internet as we fly up high north and, and lose our internet and get frustrated that we can't work. Right. Um, <laughs> and they sit in like this little teeny tiny closet. <laughs> Um, Left, but we can five fit. degrees. It's the forward yes. lab, and, and it's like yeah. turn the satellite. He's in there. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> um, so it, we fit about can fit up to twelve, depending on the configuration on the Gulf Stream. Um, predominantly, so your service chiefs, your secretaries, and your combatant commands are all what's considered like a uh, must ride Miller, and that's to preserve their time. Um, 
So we're able to do things like work a full day, leave at 8 p.m., fly all night long to Europe, and then hit the ground running, um, which sounds really cool, super exhausting in practice. Yeah, right. <laughs> Being efficient is exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Being efficient is super exhausting. It's really cool though. Cause it means you get to, you know, go and see a lot of cool places. Um, we, I've been to Europe a couple of times, Germany, Norway, Scotland, um, New Zealand, Hawaii, Japan, um, Greenland, and then all throughout the U S so we'll, we'll do something like, you know, I'll get up at my normal time, leave the house at six o'clock in the morning, drive to Andrews, we'll fly to Florida, do an entire day, and I'm back home by 7 p.m. So it, it makes the, the schedule really tenable, yeah, <laughs> but no, exhausting cool. as you're shaking your head. <laughs> so how often are you traveling a month? Right now, it's not so bad because we just finished. Uh, so in the springtime, you have all of your posture hearings in, in the different committees over in Congress. So we just finished all of those hearings. So you're, you're largely here in the D.C. area. Um, but at least a couple times a month. Uh, for a while there, as I started with General Raymond. And as he finished his tenure, we were pretty much – I started with him in June – and then they transitioned in November, and I think I was home a grand total of about two weeks straight between June and November. We we're just constantly wow. on the road. Wow! So. And then you mentioned uh, Cheyenne Mountain is a Space Force facility, right? Mm-hmm. Have you been there? I have. Yeah. Like in the mountain. In the mountain. Yep. Giant. Giant. Uh, but it's everything that you've seen in the movies: the giant doors that close and and lock down. So it's it's designed to be your kind of last stand missile warning location like things are firing we're locking in the mountain and and the little pods that's that's actually i don't know if you know this that's where the colorado springs are because the pods are on these giant springs and that's your that's your colorado yeah, springs the right waves, the yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. who would have thought how's the uh, how's the cell phone service in there <laughs> not so great not so great your yeah. blackberry can't uh, no, my, my blackberry, blackberry can't doesn't, doesn't hold up that much granite <laughs> Uh, my blackberry can't penetrate my bedroom that's walls cool. half the time. <laughs> uh, now, have you watched the show Veep? I have not. Okay. Because they've got, um, that's the vice president show and they have kind of the aide for the vice president running mm-hmm. around. And I'm just picturing this person like holding this big leather like folio and briefcase and like all and the this. the football. Yeah, just all yeah. this stuff. And uh, like, Do you wear glasses at work and your hair is all messed up? Yeah, and you're just running just, around I mean, my hair is often messed up and I do carry a very large bag, yes. Um, it is not the same football that the that the vice president carries. It's uh, yeah, largely right. full of nothing that Nothing's things. handcuffed to your wrist or anything? Okay. Just, no. no okay. It should be sometimes because I leave little pieces of my soul all around the world in this job, yeah. but <laughs> as I'm All sure right. you're also familiar with, yes, with the travel. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, okay. I'll get you out on this last question. What would be your dream job in the space force one day? Is there something that you're, you're aiming towards or a passion that you have that you could see um, in the space force? Any, uh, any thoughts on that? Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, hmm. but here we go. Yeah, but we're putting yeah, you on the spot. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Go ahead, and go I'm on the spot. Nobody's asking. Yeah, I just, um, it's hard to say, I think, like, right now, so I'm a, like I said, I'm a career intel officer, what I would love to do is do something, like, I'm, I'm coming up to the point in my career where I'll be moving into leadership positions, so like squadron and then um, Delta Command, um, and I would love to command a squadron that's not just a Intel squadron. So uh, largely in the Air Force, we're very stuck in our camps, if you will. So if you're an Intel person, you're going to stay within Intel and mm-hmm. you must color within the Intel lines. Otherwise, you don't you don't march to the same beat of the drum of your peers and you're not going to promote. And the Space Force is trying to get away from that slowly where we're so small um, there, you know, you've got to be steeped in what our emissions are and have an understanding of um, our operations and then the other specialties as well. So I would love to kind of bridge that gap since I, I do have a large space focus and, and command um, either like some kind of space situational awareness miss it, mission or, or something down the lines, but not really anything that's like, super cool or sexy or anything. Um, but <laughs> well, it's like you mentioned, you know, I mean, 
you're at a startup right now. Yeah. And also, I think, especially with the technology, the way it changes is, again, I think, you know, 15 years, your mission could change a little bit, you know? Absolutely. And yeah. You could so be, you know, looks like. trying to stop the AI, AI from launching its own satellite. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> so that is exciting. Well, um, Major Casey Lawler, we really appreciate you joining us today to, to educate us a little bit. Um, on the Space Force. A little bit. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah I think we have a lot today. I went from to zero honest. to yeah. Yeah, knowing a tiny little bit at least. But, um, awesome, awesome. Uh, so next time Max is at Cheyenne Mountain, he's going to reach out and um, for a tour. Yeah. Try and get a don't, little tour. Don't get your uh, fingers stuck in the yeah. springs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much, and uh, we appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, go Eagles. And, oh, right. yeah, go Eagles. Yeah, go Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Max, that was really cool. Yeah. Refreshing to uh, talk to somebody from Embry Riddle that clearly did not spend time with us uh, and get weighed down uh, in the in the mud. Casey's on a much better trajectory. Yes, a much higher before. trajectory. <laughs> yes, <laughs> doing real things. Uh, doing real things. So uh, good, good, good move, Casey, not hanging out with us at Embry Riddle. Uh, but uh, thank you for coming on and educating us a little bit about Space Force. I really enjoyed learning about it. And it's just, it's cool to hear that there is forward thinking individuals that are planning for the next, the next frontier, as they say. Moving on to flight advice. This is a big one, Max. So, of course, we'd like to thank our friends at Harvey Watt for sponsoring, longtime sponsors of flight advice. You can see all of the offerings that Harvey Watt has for professional pilots around the globe. Loss of medical insurance, life insurance, it's all there at harveywatt.com. You can log in, play with the little calculator there, see exactly what your premium would be. It's money well spent protecting that valuable piece of white paper, which I'm happy to announce. Um, I finally found a wallet that fits that thing without barely having to fold it. So huge accomplishment. Yeah. I didn't even know that was a problem. So Yeah. Well, what, how do you fold your medical? Into force. and shove it in there behind my certificate and i literally don't think about it at all don't you oh you're not a commuter you don't have to pull it out oh yeah no in the commuters it's a pain in the butt because you're I constantly see. pulling it out yeah no, anyways harveywatt.com protect that piece of paper however you fold it let's jump into the flight advice this is this is an important one for now and this could change when the ro- when we have robot co-pilots um but for now email says hey guys I'm in a big conundrum. I'm a younger dude flying with an older pilot. Usually we enjoy our time flying together in the cockpit. The problem stems when we get on the ground. This older pilot loves eating at chain restaurants on overnight guys. And I don't know what to do. I'd like to expand my horizons. I have access to all of the apps, Yelp, Google, even the layover guides you provide. We just end up going to Chili's every time. What should I do? Oh, I feel for you, bro. We've all been there. We have all been there. Yes. Get to, oh, meet you downstairs in five. How yeah. much time you need? Yeah. How much time you need? Yeah. All right. I think riblets are on sale tonight. Yeah. I've put these new white New Balance on and uh, Levi jeans so many times. I'll be down there in three. So, yeah. A homeboy rolls downstairs and it's like, well, what's it tonight? Applebee's, Chili's, or... Uh, should we yeah. splurge at the Outback? TGI Fridays. Oh. It, and it's worse. It adds insult to injury when you're in a place like London. <laughs> That's when it's even the worst. Like, you're, you're oh, we're so... And then it's... Dude, anywhere. Yeah. Like, there's so... Oh. That's a tough one, though, because I don't know how you... Uh, I know a great uh, Irish uh, pub. There's a couple different... I mean, here's what you really got to do. You have to... Well, first of all, I should say, especially in business aviation, usually if you're flying with the same pilot over and over again, you're pr- pretty quickly going to figure out what they like and what they don't like. So what I would do is figure out what it is that they are getting at Applebee's and Chili's every time. Maybe it's the ribs or you know salmon, whatever it is. Tacos. And then, yeah, figure that out and then do some research on an overnight that you know where they're going to do some a great version of of what this pilot gets. Yeah. And the thing is too, you got to ease them in. Like if it's, say, yeah. say they go to Chili's and they get the chicken soft tacos like every time, mm. right? In the case of dip or something ridiculous. Like, yeah. But you, you don't want to get too aggressive. Like you, you got to yeah. just go to like 
not a re- like you, you don't want to go somewhere then the sp- the menus in Spanish like a real authentic no. taco shop and they have like menudo on Mondays and you know you want yeah, to go to a kind of an Americanized taco shop Tex Mex yeah steak, just like a little a just a yeah. little bit just to say hey you know this Chevy's. is this is also close to Chili's but is much higher rated on Yelp and Google it turns out so how about we try that well I don't, maybe we should role play this Dylan. Well, oh, should we? What do you say? Uh, I'm in the mood for tacos from Chili's. Oh, you know, oh, tacos sounds so good. I'd love to. I was talking to the girl at the FBO, and she said oh. the best tacos are at so and so. I was thinking maybe we well. could check it out. What do you think? I'll drive the rental car. Well, you know, uh, you know, I like consistency in my cuisine, Dylan. I don't know. If- <laughs> Is uh, what if we get sick? We have an yeah. important trip tomorrow. Huge reviews, Yelp and Google. Everyone's saying this place is something we should check out. Let's give it a shot. If it doesn't work out, we'll go to Applebee's tomorrow night in Greenville, Spartanburg. Uh, it is all you can eat riblets, so <laughs> I'll take that deal. Get a, a little bit of finesse. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think that's that's step one, but. Man, I think we've all been there, and it, it can be brutal. There's nothing that hurts me more than going to a chain restaurant. <laughs> Do you remember the guy that I flew with that was this that was this dude? And this was when the iPad 1 first came out, and I got the yeah. iPad 1, and I had the cellular. Do you remember what he called the iPad yes. when I would be like, I would use it to navigate and stuff and like yeah. and pull up like review or whatever. And do you remember what he said? <laughs> Max, why don't you get out your magic book? <laughs> Called it the magic book. <laughs> that was the best. And he was a total chain restaurant guy and wear white New Balance shoes. Oh, he I did a does. contract trip with this nicest guy. I love flying with him. I did a contract trip with him to San Francisco. We stayed at like the hotel, like the Crown Plaza, right at SFO, which, if you're not familiar, is not really near downtown. But he goes, Hey, um, I, they've got a seafood place down by the wharf in downtown. Uh, I'd love to go to tonight if you want to go, if you're up for a drive into town. I said, sure. So we get in the car, maybe drive, what is it, 30, 40 minutes to downtown from SFO. And then you got to go to Fisherman's Wharf, touristy area, pay for parking. It's a huge pain in the butt to get get down here. But, you know, I'm like, oh, cool, you know, mix it up with something. Seafood. So we walk down the pier, walk in, boom, Bubba Gump <laughs> Company. <laughs> Yeah, Don't you know, that. and then he gets like a basket of fried fish and chips, you know, not even on a plate. I'm just like, what? we just drove two hours for this. Oh, my gosh. So, <laughs> the, it's, Oh, my God. That's the yeah, best. Did you guys just, go to Chinatown in uh, in yeah. Chicago next and go to Panda Express? <laughs> I know a great place. I know a great. They got this orange yeah. chicken. I'll tell you what. Yeah. You cannot uh, beat it. You get up, be beat. But uh, listen, I would use the layover guide on our website. Maybe show them that. Uh, I think, honestly, the most powerful tool is saying, oh, someone at the FBO recommended this. We should probably check it out kind of a thing. Um, and then that way you can kind of divert the blame a little bit if they hate it. That's smart. And the, But the other thing, too, is just make sure it's good because yeah. this may be your one shot. And if you blow it, you're you going to be shot. stuck in Don't. chain restaurant hell right. for the rest yeah. of your career with this Oh, person so just you're just going to be eating no rules it's so funny too when is the last oh. time you ate at a chain restaurant on the road well oh oh <laughs> i mean I, I would say i'm in con charge now so things are a little different <laughs> <laughs> let's put it that way <laughs> oh, i love a lot of chain restaurants then oh, well no actually I, sh- I do confess though because i do go to starbucks a lot in the morning does that count it does count me, right? it does count but it's Ooh. it's yeah. uh sometimes but the thing about starbucks is it's unavoidable like at some point dude yeah. especially now with the app and the thing you go to the airport and there's this line and i'm just yeah even i, I i'm not a big starbucks fan but even i get sucked in with the app and pre-ordering so i can just walk up and pick up my coffee and i love that's the best part when you go through you walk to the airport and you literally getting out on the curb before security and everything i order my my coffee 
and you walk up and there's a line five miles long and you just walk up and grab your coffee like barely even lose stride people are like what what, what is this what is this it's the uniform um so yeah i i don't know and chick-fil-a other, too uh, i think chick-fil-a yeah. is probably can be sure and, and on any length of trip i mean listen sometimes you got to go to outback steakhouse it's okay <laughs> i told you i listened to this this is actually pretty fun. i don't know if i should divulge this but i'm going to anyway so you know how the line at chick-fil-a gets very egregious right at the, at the airport i mean the scene okay. and a lot of times too certain airports like san jose like it can be a a, a hall a walk to chick-fil-a oh yeah and, and you have a quick turn or whatever and so it's it's usually it's, it's actually impossible to wait in the chick-fil-a line and get your food and make it back in on time yeah and so i've walked up there in this huge line and i just walk up right from like sorry everyone i got i got a quick I got a flight. I got to catch uh, only in uniform, obviously at work and just yeah. go up. I'm like, I'm, is that okay? If do you mind if I cut in line, I just have no time. They're like, Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem. Yeah. yeah. But the best is when you do that and there's other, mm. there's other crew members. Waiting oh, in other the line. crew members in line. Oh yeah. <laughs> You're like, Oh, See, that was what I was going to say. Like, you got you a quick turn. Sure, yeah. 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 You got to make sure uh, who else is in line. I do only pull, play that card though. Like seriously, when I don't have any time, otherwise. Okay. You know, I'll allow it. <laughs> oh, wow. thank you. I feel better now. Yeah. If anyone gives you yeah. a hard time, get that one off your chest. Yeah. <laughs> if you see anyone, see anyone uh, aggressively cutting to the front of the line, Chick Fil A, it's probably you, Max. You know, Hit actually, him up. He'll have some stickers. You want to what? Listen to this. This happened to Dow in uh, Dallas Left Field. I was waiting in the Chick Fil A line, and I kind of wasn't paying that much attention to the time or whatever. All of a sudden, I look. I'm like, oh my! I was like, two more people to go, and it's me. And I'm yeah. like, oh my god! I'm like, there's, I don't, I literally don't have time because by the time I order and wait for my food, I'm not going to have time. And so I'm like, oh, and I kind of like sighed and I get out of line and I walked and my, the gate I was going to was right, like direct line of sight, right across from Chick-fil-A, like not very far. So I walk and I, I walk down and, you know, go to the cockpit and do my thing and blah, blah, blah. And like 10 minutes later, uh, the ops agent walks down with a Chick-fil-A bag and she hands it to me. She goes, hey, she goes, somebody uh, who was waiting in line at Chick-fil-A saw you not be able to order your food and, and so they bought you. A sandwich and they like walked it over my gate mm. and gave it to the ops agent she walked down and gave it to me it, no way i swear it was awesome wow i know this is, it restored some faith in humanity for me that was incredible that's all that's all the chick-fil-a stories i have for right now thank you yeah okay that's pretty good it was grilled chicken though so you threw it no out. it was but, i mean dude, they, what the would you get if you yeah. didn't know what to order i just like the regular yeah, crisp, the original. Like, crispy chicken original. sandwich yeah you can't go wrong yeah. with the original that's awesome. I know. It's awesome. Maybe they were a fan. Random act of kindness. That's Try right. sometime. So uh, I, I, hopefully we answer your question. I think just be careful. Uh, definitely worth doing, though. I think because once you can kind of make that that convert, when you can slowly win them over, maybe just one meal a trip you get to pick eventually. Or what do you think about the other option of just going on like a hunger strike, just being like, hey, I'm going to this other place. What do you just power move and be like, take the car. I'm just going to walk to this other place over here. Do you think that's a good move where you split up or is it better to stay together? I think you obviously have to go down the uh, the road of compromise first. It's just like it's often it's like yeah. marriage, you know, Yeah, got to try everything you can first. But it, at some point, if there's just no movement on either end, you know, you're just going to have to go to the Lebanese place down the street. That's just it. That's all you have to do. He's got the special <laughs> garlic sauce. There's nothing else you can do about it. Ah, it's unbelievable. <laughs> this economy. It's the story for another day. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, hopefully we uh, provided some flight advice. If you have any tips, tricks, uh, or uh, secrets on how to convince that uh, other crew member that does not have a very... Uh, adventurous palette into exploring out beyond the, the world of chain restaurants, please write in and let us know. We realize uh, there's probably more than one way to skin this cat. So uh, info at 215podcast.com. We'd love to hear your secrets. Is the Bubba Gump on, on story to... true? Though? It's 100% true. I have a great <laughs> seafood place for you. Oh, I, It would have been one thing like if we had driven like a mile but we drove 45 minutes and then had to park in some public parking structure, pay for that then walk across this whole pier. And then he just walked up here and I'm just like, Oh my God, you got to be kidding. I mean, and there is no worse <laughs> seafood than Bubba, which is all fried. 
Oh, that is so, that's a classic one, dude. That is classic. Yeah. That is, yeah. All right. I don't know. Sometimes yeah. I wonder if people no, the think only thing stuff that, is as funny as we do, but no. The only thing that would have been worse is if he would have like gone to like Long John Silver's or something. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's it. If you if you got any additional advice, let us know. Um, we'd love to help Airman out. This is a, this is a serious topic. That is that is very serious, serious to me because that will yeah. just kill It'll any just trip. Kill the yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. I thought of another one. A really good trip through a uh, chain restaurant hell. I flew with a dude. Okay. Do you remember when the Hooters passport thing promotion was going on? Oh, and they gave you the Hooters passport. <laughs> Did you ever fly with that guy? You know what I'm talking about? And everywhere we went, we had to seek out a Hooters dude. And it was like, no matter the drive or whatever, because he was on a mission. Because if you filled out the Hooters passport, you could get a free party at Hooters. And I wasn't <laughs> flying with him full time. I think I was a contract guy, but I was, fl- I was flying a lot with him. So, like, I was dreading the day because I was like, oh, my God. Like, after a while, I'm like, there's no way this has got it. He's going to give up on this. And he would not give up. And we would go to Hooters far and wide, man. And it was getting out of control. And he and I'm like, he's going to do like and I wasn't like I said, I was not flying with him the whole time. So he was doing this not with me, too. I'm like, oh, my God, dude, this guy is going to get the Hooters party. If I get an invitation to the Hooters party in in town, there's no way I'm going to that. And. I don't know that he ever did achieve what, 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 what kind of party is being held at a Hooters? I like, do. What, is, what are you winning? Something stupid. You, 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 you and 20 yeah. of your guests and we'll give you 150 wings and, you know, two beers per person. It's the dumbest thing ever. I remember this. I totally It would be the biggest the utter name. waste of time ever. And the, so not only are you going to a chain restaurant, but you're going to the same He's freaking driving. chain. And th- their menu is not very diverse. It's not like you're going to the Cheesecake Factory and there's 900 yeah. pages. Like, dude, this is Hooters. So that was the worst. That one, that one takes the cake. And there was no talking that about it. You thought cake. you, it was Miller Lite and the Hooters, dude. That was it. It's time to wrap it up. Okay. Well, uh, well, that is going to do it for number one Oh two. Thank you so much to our listeners who wrote emails and reviews for us. Mr. Timothy P. Pope joining us with his financial expertise. Casey Lawler joining us to educate us on space force. Advanced Air Crew Academy, Harvey Watt, and Joel, who keeps us organized and on time, especially when we're all on vacation. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks, guys. Yeah. All right. Well, until until next time, remember. Flexibility is the key to getting interviews together with multiple pilots. We'll see you next time. The statements made in this show are our own opinions and do not reflect, nor were they under any direction from any of our employers.